We're talking about the okay. tiny bubbles out back of the university. Uh, and uh, you first, uh, you know, coming across with the first time. And when did you start developing an idea that you should be, you know, you should be looking into that? And, and yeah. And, and whether or not those tiny bubbles make us happy or not. Um, <laughs> it's, it's going I would say. The, yeah, it's a Don Ho song. You know, the, uh, uh, it's just a pun. I'm sorry. <laughs> Basically yeah, a pun. no, I mean, I liked it. It was, I thought it was a, it's a very ironic question. Um, mm -hmm. I, there are, those little bubbles are one of the things that makes me most happy. My most joyous moments in life, not the most, but among the top five are peering down into water and watching these little bubbles come up. To me, they are fascinating. Where, the, where are they coming from in the sediments? How deep down um, they're beautiful. So I have some of my most joyous moments observing these bubbles. Now, if we step back and ask what are in the bubbles, um, then the implications of that might not be so joyous. <laughs> um, and, and what's in the bubbles is methane gas. And methane is a, a greenhouse gas about 30 times stronger than carbon dioxide on a 100 year time frame. Um, so as these bubbles come up through the water and then they often will float at the lake surface for a minute and then pop, they're releasing uh, almost pure methane. It's often 80, 90% methane into the atmosphere. And there as a greenhouse gas, it can trap incoming solar radiation and, and lead to warming of the planet. Um, so if there are more and more of these bubbles with climate change, then it's an additional source of warming. And, and that, that really is I'd say that's the part of the research that gets funded. <laughs> um, <laughs> honest, to be honest, I am just fascinated by the bubbles themselves and why they occur, where they occur, how many are there. And then again, if I could only have glasses that would let me see down into the sediments, um, I, I would just love to know them even more than I am able to know them through my observations of, of what I measure. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one of the, the, the your description early on is uh, is almost you know, anthropomorphic, and so you, know, you really sort of make, make the uh, make it a being almost. It's almost like a creature come alive, and you know very well. And you're the psychologist of this lake, and I thought that was funny. It was good, but the, do you have? I mean, what is that? What is that all about? Do you have like? Do you feel like that way towards nature in general? That you you're, you're sort of it's a person you're speaking with, and <laughs> well, a lot of my research was done in Russia, so I was working with Russians and the Russian, these lakes form, if, if, if a person were to look at a map of the Arctic or look at Google Earth, you would see that unlike a lot of the lower 48 and certain parts of Europe, true for too, lakes are just everywhere. Um, there are millions of lakes. They are a dominant feature on the landscape. And the reason the lakes are there in Siberia and Alaska is that the ice, the ground is frozen and it has blocks of ice in it. And so when that ice melts, um, the ground surface sinks and th those sinkholes fill with water. And then it starts as a small pond, a small pond surrounded by very icy soils. And because the pond has more heat in it, that heat, and the heat comes from the sun, sun in summer, that heat causes the ice around the pond to melt. And so the pond gets bigger and bigger. And the Russian word for that is that the pond is eating the eating the ground around it. Right. Um, and I think that that's a very, it's a wonderful metaphor because mm -hmm. when these, the part that wasn't ice that's frozen soil in that soil are the, the remains of dead plants and animals, right. including mammoths and things that lived during the last ice age. And so when all that dead plant and animal material thaws out and falls into the bottom of the lake. It's like it's falling into the lake's gut. Ruminant animals today are a source of methane. <clears throat> and in their gut live microbes that are digesting organic matter and generating methane. The same thing's happening in the bottom of the lake. There are microbes down there chewing on this old dead plant and animal remains and it's making the methane gas. So it's a, it's a metaphor, but it's also, <laughs> it's also very accurate. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, it sounds like Montezuma's revenge in a way. But uh, <laughs> um, in your book, you write, uh, "I moved away from my family at the age of thirteen uh, in 1992. At age 16, I went to live on my my own for a year in Russia in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, 
can you say more about this intriguing experience? It sounds like, you know, what a, what a great time to be there, you know, the see sort of a change. <laughs> well, it was, a, yeah, it was a, looking back, it was a fascinating time to be there. Um, I had come from what I thought was a poor family, unstable family. We were on food stamps. We moved a lot. And I did, and I, we lived in suburbia and it just didn't seem like, uh, I, I wasn't satisfied. I was looking for more. And so this opportunity came to be an exchange student in Russia. And that was um, <laughs> probably any American who's ever traveled and lived in a, another country or a developing country, especially realize, just realize, puts their life back into context. And so yeah. even though I thought I was poor, when I got to Russia, I saw what poor was, yeah. um, especially at that time, the entire economy had collapsed. Everything was broken. I mean, it was interesting because as I went through the town, the size of the building, the size of the parks looked very grand and beautiful at one time, but nobody had kept them up. And so it was decrepit and broken. <laughs> and it, it made you wonder what did this look like in its heyday? It must've been beautiful, yeah. um, but it had deteriorated. And the people, um, the, according to the standards of living I had come from, you know, they, they had one pair of clothes that they wore in their house and one pair that they wore outside. Um, yeah. The girls I played basketball with at the university were wearing their one and only pair of little high heeled sandals. That's they, that's all they had. That's what they played basketball in. Um, so, and then the, the instability of the ruble, um, it, it was, yeah, it was a challenging time for them. And then as a 16 year old, it, in a completely unfamiliar world, I didn't speak the language. I was scared to death, <laughs> um, yeah. just trying to make sense of it all. Yeah, yeah. A few years back, I did a couple of years ago. I did a uh, an interview with uh, a lady who's doing a um, uh, creative uh, video. You know, she's doing a video story of the lives of Estonians right after the fall of uh, the Soviet Union, and uh, it depicted these people sort of almost like zombies coming out of like like the spirit was you know, re uh, reanimating, you know, they, they, it's like they had been living in a cold freeze themselves. And that's also an apt metaphor in the sense that, you know, we're here, we are coming, Siberians thawing. And these people were thawing at the end of, you know, 89, 90, 91, people were to be coming to life again after coming out of the Soviet regime. So. Um, it, they seemed like they were in survival mode to me. Um, right. You know, the lines that you had to wait in to get anything, <laughs> flour, sugar, there were not a lot of options of what you could buy. Um, and you went around searching from one little shop or kiosk to the next to find things empty. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, even know if I didn't seem for most of the Russians I met, it didn't seem, it seemed like they were necessarily thawing. It seemed like they were worried. They didn't, <laughs> they were trying to survive. Right. Right. Yeah. There's a difference. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, you write uh, coming to terms with my, tripartite role of wife, mother, and scientist, I've had to face an entirely new kind of challenge, the dark inner workings of my own heart. Can you say more about the role and the darkness? Well, until I, until I actually got married, um, and I had moved out at the age of 13, so I myself was learning to survive. I didn't have money, and, um, but in that path of survival, I was very self-serving. Everything I did was for myself and for my future. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get married, if that marriage is going to work, now there's two people. So yeah. there's a part of compromise and dying to yourself that has to happen. And then bring little children into the picture um, <laughs> that depend on you for life. I found that very natural. I wanted to feed them and, and take yeah. care of their physical needs. Um, but there's more than that, yeah. that, that, that needs to take place. So um yeah, I was finding I could not focus just on myself and what I love to do with science. I love to travel the world and um, explore extreme environments in the Arctic. And you can't do that with little kids, yeah. with little babies. <laughs> uh, I did some, but it's not um, not to the same degree. So I had to really decide, am I going to leave this family and continue to serve myself and my desires to do research and <laughs> explore? Or am I going to um, live and serve some other people? And yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to serve somebody. But, uh, but I, you know, the, the, it does bring up, I mean, you, you've uh, chosen to uh, uh, be in a, a situation where you're, you know, you're living in a remote area with your children and say doing, you know, doing school home, uh, homeschooling, but that might be, you know, you, lots of people do homeschooling. That's fine these days, especially with the internet. But um, do you, do you find that uh, it's very, obviously it's very time consuming, but is there something gratifying about doing the homeschooling rather than sending them off someplace? Or, uh, you know, from your Absolutely. Family? Yeah. And I think you have another question in there, um, which is about the more, it's more of that metaphor of the lake as being alive. It comes later. And so I think writing this book actually has, for me, it was a very freeing thing to do. Um, I think I had, I had lived a certain life. <laughs> well, what I actually, I think of my GPS, my GPS, when I use it in field work, it collects a thousand points. It, that's how many it can store. So if I take one more point, it will erase the information of the original one. It overwrites it. And I felt that having children um, was going to over, in order to be present with them and enjoy, be fully present and give my heart to the moments we have together, I was going to be overriding and forgetting my past, which was no longer the world I was living in with them. So I wanted to write this book so that I could get it down and in some ways let go of it or <laughs> be able to put it on a shelf without feeling resentment or this tug of not being able to be present because I was still so much holding on to the past. Um, so after being freed from that, uh, absolutely. I love homeschooling. I mean, it's challenging and it's another part of the inner workings of the heart. I am looking at a mirror constantly at my impatience. Yeah. I'm not a gentle person. Um, so it's very revealing and difficult on my own character, but to spend that time with our Halloween yesterday, we took blankets out. We got our homeschool done and we took blankets out into the sunshine in the yard and read scary stories and made cupcakes. And, you know, if you're if you're rushing home from public school, it's hard to just take the, have those relaxing moments. And yeah. when you are homeschooled, it's, you have a lot more freedom. Um, you can, yeah. first of all, your child cannot get away with uh, not being pushed to their, what they're capable of. So you get to realize the potential of your children in a different way. Um, you get to have a relationship with them in a, in a more relaxed environment. So and they get to learn so many, they get to learn from people of all walks and ages of life rather than only just their peers um, right. in a certain cohort. So, yeah, we enjoy did you it. Take a certain, did you take a certain educational approach like Montessori or, and did you sort of focus on, did you like try to get rid of subjects that really weren't, did you have a hierarchical scale for the subjects of the most importance? You know, you, you know obviously faith and science are going together. But after that, you know, English skills and math, you know, <laughs> you know, the thing that we spend the most time on in our homeschool is cello. And I'm not a musician, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we there, especially when they were younger, we would spend up to three hours a day on the cello to learn twinkle, twinkle for a year. <laughs> and what goes on there, it's you're learning an instrument, but that instrument is really the means to character development and getting habits, not if I'm not letting my son get away with not doing his best. Um, so yes, we do. I'd say the basics are math and, and I like to read to them a lot of literature. They didn't learn to read till, uh, they, till they were really ready. So it was different than the school ages, but now they love to read and write. They're excellent at it. So we try to just take a, a more a natural approach with um, what fits their needs and interests, but at the same time, make sure that certain elements are in there. But then a lot of discipline. The cello is a place of discipline. But anything you spend time at, so I'd say in cello, they haven't always loved me. <laughs> um, and there's been even the possibility that, that would hurt our relationship, um, I what I hold them to, that accountability. But over time, um, they've they have come to love it because anything you really invest in, uh -huh. uh, you you come to love. So, so you got to move the hump with the cello, right? Well, it's still, there's still challenges, but yes, I'd say if the goal was to get them to have um, a good work ethic yeah. and, and to actually love and make some nice music, then they're over the hump. That's excellent. Um, one of the most fascinating parts of, uh, of your journey and your story, telling it about the uh, the journey is that you, you're a Christian scientist in a relativist age. That, 
that's fascinating in itself, you know, because it's so hard to have faith anymore because of, you know, the way things are turning out for us, you know, as a collection of people trying to figure it all out. Would you care to explain this phenomenon, how it, how it works for you? Sure. Uh, when I was in college and having to decide, you know, taking all kinds of classes yeah. at a liberal arts college, um, it became really clear to me that science was where I belonged because, because of relativism. I wanted to seek truth and believe in universal truth. And mm -hmm. science is where you can have a profession uh, spending your time to understand and define and, and test natural laws and describe uh, natural phenomenon. And uh, it, there's black and white. If something's, if you have a, a, a scientific claim, it has to be falsifiable. <laughs> it's not a matter of opinion. It's, uh, if something is scientifically true, then it's not true for me and not true for you. It's not relative. <laughs> so that, that aspect of science, um, being able to write a lab report, here's what I did, here's what I found, here's why the hypothesis I had put forward was not supported. It, it's very objective and that appealed to me. Yeah. Um, so I guess there's, there's not a contradiction of being a person of faith and being a scientist. Um, so much of the science and the natural laws that we understand today came through most of them men, but some women of faith. <laughs> uh, so for a long time where we are scientifically today is because people believed in God and they, I think very much us, it's my approach too. Uh, I, I love the earth. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful place to be. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of bad and sad things that happen in it as well, but I want to understand it. Yeah. The reason I'm interested in those bubbles is they're just, they're natural and they're interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so again, pursuing that truth there and in, but I, you know, I was raised in the public school system and then went to a very liberal college. So you do get the message that you can't be a Christian and a scientist. And that, um, <laughs> that went into me as well. And so I did kind of an experiment. Plus my dad wasn't for many years. He wasn't a, a, a still is not a Christian. Um, and put a lot of doubt in my mind and, and criticism of of the even the possibility of being a Christian. So that influenced me. Yeah. So I did an experiment and decided if if I don't know if God's real, I'm going to live like he's not <laughs> yeah. and really adopted that mindset and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, so in my own life experiment, did that lead to inner peace? Did it lead to peace in relationships with other people? Mm -hmm. um, no, it did not, yeah. not inside and not outside. It led to a lot of hurt. And so then I, I would say God didn't let me go. Um, he was patient <laughs> and knocking. And as I started to open that door back into faith, um, yeah. entirely different. So a, as a person of faith today, I have inner peace. Um, uh, what the Bible tells me is right and wrong in relationships guides how I have relationships with people, or at least it convicts me of what I need to be doing better. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And it makes a big difference. So, mm -hmm. what about something like uh, you know technical? You want to look at the way you know? I was telling you about my experience, uh, Nazarene I call it, uh, you know, creationism versus evolution. For instance, how, how do you handle a dichotomy like that? Or is it? Well, I have always, I mean, I work the science I do, I use radiocarbon dating. So it's in a, it's in an old earth perspective. I believe God created the earth. Um, and that was never a question that I've had to really answer in my science yeah. so much because I work in um, the present day situation of climate change. And yes, there is that context of the ice age and um, and I do paleo work, <laughs> I guess I should say. Yeah. So everything is scientifically that I've done has been in an old earth context. Mm -hmm. um, and I did some reading of creation science over the years, not a lot. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, I would say a lot of times it didn't seem like good science. Mm -hmm. That said, um, I married into a family of PhD, very intelligent people who believe in a young earth. <laughs> Uh, and now that I, we teach our children, homeschool them, um, with this question will come up and I will have to address it uh, in a way that I didn't always have to confront in my own life. It was, e it's been easy to work in an old earth context and say, well, God knows the truth. Um, <laughs> and I don't maybe someday 
when I'm dead, I will. But I guess the more uh, we, my husband's been helping me to find some really, I'd say good science um, that relates to a younger earth. And it's opening, my mind is opening. Um, I am starting to see some good, very provoking, thought provoking arguments. And so it's, I guess, like anything that I study, um, I'd like more time for it, but I want to remain open-minded to see where does the evidence actually point. And I'm talking about scientific evidence. So I'm not an expert, but I'm going to be (laughs) open-minded. Right. Um, Okay. You know, I mean, a lot of the problems around the faith, uh, you know, like when it comes to science would be something like the, the impossibility of creating something in seven days, at least in a in a time scale i'm not trying to get into religion with in a time scale that we're from you know that we're familiar with uh, today in the 21st century you know we don't, we don't believe that the, you know the whole thing was created in seven days you know not really you know i mean um but it's more yeah i think what most of the time we've gotten in trouble is because we see you know god the god we've grown up with whether it's it, under the three abrahams you know whether you're jewish or islamic or uh, christian you know they're all it's a moral god you know it's a, it's a way of behaving how we how we go into to the world with other people and yeah. uh that's, that's we're still figuring that's still a you know, work in progress but in terms of uh you know i think we can all agree that you know it, it could be no one should you know the divine creation you know positive the earth and the void and you, know, you can get into cosmology and you could still be comfortable with that concept you know that, that there was some divine force that sparked the whole thing whether it's a he or she or you know or that would even matter you know uh, um so you know it's a fascinating area anyway this uh here's an excellent passage from your book and uh, you know there's lots of excellent passages it's a great book let me just read this to you um uh now i would be able to quantify the methane concentration in my bubble samples and this was the start of a slow burn scientific epiphany i'd known that bubbles from other lakes being studied around the world had clocked in at around 20 to 60 percent methane samples i had collected in the human man uh, ponds in lakes not affected by thermal cars were within the same range but as i started to run samples from bubble traps that had been placed along the margins of thermal cars lakes places where permafrost was uh, most rapidly thawing i saw the concentrations of methane shoot up one sample was 80 percent another 85 i couldn't believe my eyes i found uh, samples with 90 percent maybe 95 percent these very high concentrations indicated that thermal cars methane bubbles were special could you say more about the epiphany and why these methane bubbles are special and more about the traps? Yeah, so when I landed in Siberia as a graduate student, my job was to quantify or measure, figure out how much methane was coming out of these lakes. And so I did that. I started out by, um, and when you're in Siberia, you don't, I only had whatever scientific equipment I had been able to bring over in bags or, or send it in advance, which wasn't a lot. So I had some little three-way valves um, and some glue, but I had to basically look around and comb the roadsides and things that the, when, when the Soviet Union fell apart, people who were in Siberia, this was Stalin's gulag region his prison camp. So when people left, they left things behind. <laughs> and so I went and looked at their, looked through their dumps and found all kinds of old metal and bricks. And then I got some wire spools um, and then greenhouse plastic. And I basically constructed funnels. They had a wire ring on the bottom and then a plastic, plastic sheeting coming up. And then I would took beer bottles or water bottles that people had left um, littered on the road and rinse them out and invert them. So I had a bo- upside down bottle with a skirt on it. And then I put a little tube with a valve at the top. And then this whole, that was my bubble trap and I put it underwater. So the whole thing was full of water, the bottle, the skirt, everything. And then when bubbles would come up out of the bottom of the lake, they would go into the skirt and they'd get funneled up into that inverted plastic bottle. And over time, the bubbles would accumulate in there and displace the water. So then I'd end up with a a plastic water bottle full of bubbles. Mm -hmm. And then I could open the valve and release the gas and take a sample of it. Um, So I, what I was seeing is, and I, you know, I had many failed attempts and frustrations and in the book, it'll talk about even how some of that (laughs) maybe almost like as if a miracle had happened with those traps at one point um, was helping me to come back to faith. Cause at that point I was, I was not a practicing Christian. Um, 
But in my traps, this gas, I needed to know its content. It could have just been air. It could have been nitrogen. None of those things would burn. Um, but if they had methane in them, methane is a natural gas, so it's flammable. And so I could take a sample of it and bring it back to the, the field lab in Siberia and, and inject it into a gas chromatograph, which was an instrument that I had to get working. And um, there was a stream of nitrogen, which would carry my little pulse of gas across a flame. And if the gas had methane in it, when it reached that flame, it would make the flame jump higher. And the, the degree of that burning <laughs> got recorded on a piece of paper and I could relate it to a methane constant, actual methane concentration. Um, so the lab, the manual I had for the instrument was in Japanese <laughs> and, and I was not a real technical person, but I realized this, thing, this, this method of measuring methane has to work if we're going to understand what was in those bubbles. And um, what I started to see was that in these lakes where permafrost was thawing and it was these decomposing mammoth remains and the grasses they were eating, the methane concentration was exceptionally high. And then when I took those, those bubbles and I radiocarbon dated them, um, I saw that the age of the methane, the age of the carbon on the methane was the same as the age of the mammoths and the grasses that they've been eating in the, yeah, during the ice age. So it was their thawing out that was creating it. Um, that was a really, I ended up taking samples back to the United States and working in the lab for the radiocarbon dating. And for me, that was a really uh, in, fulfilling moment in science because we always talk about billions of tons of carbon dioxide or billion in the atmosphere, <laughs> billions of tons of methane. So as if this gas weighs something, but then when I had my little bottles of bubbles, I, I could feel the glass bottle and the stopper, but I couldn't really feel the gas. And yet we talk about it as having a mass. So in my bottle was almost pure methane. A methane is a carbon with four hydrogens, and it's supposed to have some mass. Well, the radiocarbon date it, you have to take the gas out of a bottle, run it through a process, and strip those hydrogens off so that all you have left is the carbon, the exact carbon atoms that were in the bottle. And by the time I did that, took the hydrogens off, I had a little piece of graphite in my hand that I could see and feel. <laughs> um, so, and it was the exact molecules, uh, the exact atoms of carbon that had been on the methane in the bottle. There was yes. no exchange. There was nothing else added to it. So that was one of the things where um, seeing is believing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, how, was the, uh, how was living in a cold climb uh, more telling uh, than in the lower 48? That that's a that's an interesting question um i guess what i would start by saying anything can be telling if we open our eyes to observe and one thing that all of us can do no matter where we live whether it's the tropics or the arctic is or the temperate zone of the lower 48 is look and observe write things down measure things establish a baseline so that we can see uh, what when things are changing Area and how fast yeah. they're because it happens everywhere. We just all need to see it. Right. Um, but the Arctic is a place where the change is happening faster. The Arctic is warming three times faster than the rest of the planet, mm -hmm. and a large part of that, and it's very noticeable, visually noticeable. And a large part of that is because the Arctic has been for a long time covered in ice and snow. So we have sea ice. We have snow on the tundra. And when all that white surface, when, when su the sunlight hits it, it gets reflected back out. That's called, that's called high albedo. Yeah. But if the sea ice melts and you take a, a white ice covered ocean and replace it with a dark blue ocean surface, or you melt the snow in the tundra, instead of a white reflective tundra, now you have a brown tundra, those darker surfaces will absorb the incoming solar radiation instead of um, reflecting it. And that can cause that atmosphere and ground to heat up. It's also very, I, what I study permafrost, frozen ground that in a lot of places has ice in it. And so, and I've done this now for um, 23 years. And for many years, again, I got my grants funded by saying climate change is going to cause permafrost to thaw, but did I honestly actually see it? I saw some, 
but nothing that was alarming to me until uh, probably with definitely the last 10 years, possibly the last six to seven years, I've seen dramatic changes. <laughs> um, but I, so, it, you know, we have these models for the future and the, they always see, we always wonder how accurate are they? But it's very interesting to live at a time where some of those models are starting to come true before your very eyes. And pl places that I've driven in my car um, are now surrounded by water. It's like you're in a, just moats of water everywhere because the ground ice is melting. Roads that used to be flat are now bumpy and humpy because yeah. this ground ice is melting. So it, it does seem like the changes are taking place and they're taking place faster. Um, well, they're and they're definitely in the Arctic, but anyone can see it if, if people will yeah. observe. Um. When you, I've, I've been reading, I do a lot of political reading, which is depressing, but uh, one thing that I was reading about recently, it was like it was, uh, the ex-head of NATO was uh, talking about uh, how exciting it is in the Arctic region because it, you know, because of the permafrost is melting, the way they look at it, it's going to open up uh, new fossil fuels. Uh, 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 so, and they, they, they expect a, uh, a race between you know the Russians, of course. We've been at war basically with the Russians for about 100 years, but... Uh, Depending on, but you know the the race you go to Arctic uh, as it opens up uh, and, uh, uh, to uh, fossil fuel uh, pumping. You know, and how, how do you hear something like that? If you were to read something like that, how does that? What, how would you respond to that? Knowing what you well, know. Well, and it's not just it's not just the fossil fuel. It's also all the mineral, the hard rock minerals as well. So all kinds of mining and export and resource. Well, you know, it's all of us consumers that are in our lifestyles <laughs> um, that are asking for it. So we can't only point our finger and blame the people that are actually making a living at going after the resources. If, if there wasn't a demand, <laughs> then they wouldn't be doing it. Um, but to get at that question, I think it's interesting. So, and you'll ask me later too, but my take is that we need to be responsible um, with our environment. So if there are better ways than pumping fossil fuels, we should do it. That said, permafrost caps a lot of those hydrocarbons. And as permafrost thaws, it's becoming leaky. Imagine going from a block of, of solid cheddar cheese to a block of Swiss cheese with holes in it. That's what is happening to permafrost. It is becoming permeable. There are little chimneys where this gas that's been trapped beneath permafrost can migrate up and come out. Yeah. So I've done some projects where we went and said, let's try and capture that methane that's coming out and get it to the, vi the villages of native Alaskans so that they don't have to ship in diesel fuel. Instead, they can just use this methane gas that's naturally coming out. And it became an engineering challenge because even though there was a ton of methane coming out, enough for eight to fuel 800 homes, mm -hmm. the people didn't live next to the lake. <laughs> and so when you, how do you get that gas to them? And I think what it ended up pointing at was maybe we actually do need to drill and get that natural gas out before so that people can use it in a way that we do have the, the infrastructure to use. Yeah. And it's still better for the climate because if we don't drill and use that gas locally, then it will find its way to escape. And then it's going up as methane. If you capture it and burn it, you're converting it to carbon dioxide and water vapor, which are less potent greenhouse gases people that would then use it right there on site in their towns. And they don't need to now ship diesel fuel in from somewhere else. So I would see some of that drilling as a win-win situation. Okay. Um, living in Russia, you describe a scene in which you are on a stalled tram and when you get off, there's a decapitated corpse near the tracks and you rush home to your carer. You're right. Uh, when I told, uh, let me just say, I told um, Irina. Irina, uh, Irina Mikhailovna. She was my Russian teacher at the university. Yeah. She shook her head, and the sadness that was almost always present in her eyes grew more intense. She said, Usas Hara Batsamo. Sorry about that. She exclaimed, I, I didn't think for a minute that she or any of the other hundreds of women who called on their God actually believed in any God. For too many decades, the Soviet Union had been their God, and like all idols, it had finally crumbled. The people of Russia were left empty. They're Souls were as barren as the shelves in the store. So you have been, you've known desolation and loneliness and have found comfort in your God. Spiritually, what was your response to the plight of the Russians you lived among? Did you have one or, you know, was there any way of responding that was adequate? Well, for a good part of that year, um, those were the Russians that I lived among. 
And they were, my response to them, I was just watching. <laughs> Um, I was looking, I mean, I felt the sadness around and the hope is felt like hopelessness that the people had. Um, and I, and so I was looking for something that wouldn't feel so dark and hopeless to me. Um, so I tried basketball and swimming. I was looking everywhere. I even went to the Orthodox church and nowhere did I find any feeling of hope. And then one day, I was running along the river and I saw this baptism ceremony, which I described in the book. And I got to know those people and they were different. They were just as poor as everyone else. They also had missing and gold teeth, <laughs> but they had smiles on their faces. Their faces were glowing. They had joy. They were not talking about what they were lacking. They were talking about what they had. And that was a light and that drew me. Um, and there was just a, such a, a contrast between light and dark, between the believers and those that didn't have a God to believe in, the God to believe in. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a lot like the early faith, you know, the early Christian faith that kind of, uh, you know, coming across that kind of scene where people be a lot of despair, a lot of uh, lack of hope and, um, you know, filling the heart with, uh, with, uh, with the kind of faith, you know, that, that leaps across the darkness, you know, that kind of thing uh, can make a difference, you know. It's, uh, yes. Okay. Um, you write of the lakes. Let me just read this. You write of the lakes as if they were creatures alive and kicking rather than repositories or vessels of biochemistry alone. I love this passage. The Thermokarst Lake is productive and success, successful in its work generating vast amounts of greenhouse gas in a selfish feedback cycle that causes more warming, more permafrost thawing, more lake growth. Driven by self-perpetuation, the process continues blindly until the lake breaches a topographic gradient and catastrophically drains, in essence, having eaten its way to its own death. But there is an alternate fate for a self-seeking lake. It, its margins, wasteland can become so thick with thawed soil that it can no longer effectively melt the ice around it. In this mature state of fatness, the uh, lake lounges on the landscape, digesting, burping, and venting the dwindling resources in its gut until it runs out of food. Then its character changes. Instead of hurting the environment around it by self-perpetuating global warming, the lake assumes a new role. Nutrients in the lake support the growth of plants and other organisms. And as these flourish in the lake's embrace, they soak up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and build carbon sequestering peat on the lake bottom. This positive role of helping the environment around them by absorbing greenhouse gases and accumulating peat can continue for a very long time. The longer it continues, the better its impact on the world. This is, you know, symbiotic, and uh, you know, it sounds sort of like your, you know, your own journey. You know, your journey uh, um, in some, you know, some degree, but also the world's journey you know, from the excesses of uh, materialism uh, and its dangers. You know, we're all becoming, you know, so a lot of us are becoming obese and uh, and that's causing problems in our health. And, you know, there's a sort of parallel metaphorism going on where, you know, the, we can see what's happening to the earth in our own bodies, you know, the, the, the shapes that are changing in unhealthy ways. And you want to say something about that symbiotic uh, relationship? Yeah. Um, So you just read what happens when, when a lake is born. And like a lot of people, and for sure me, not everyone, we can start out pretty selfish where we are self-focused, self-centered, yeah. um, and hurting, ultimately hurting other people around us yeah. and the environment around us or our own health, as you're saying. Um, but these lakes, as they so they would just grow every year, melting more ice, eating more of that thawing permafrost, belching out more methane, which causes warming and more thaw. But then yeah. if a lake survived, because sometimes they would catastrophically drain and lead to their own death by this, <laughs> by expanding their gluttony would lead to their own death. But if they survived that and, and didn't get killed, <laughs> um, then a lake did change and yeah. it would, it would run out of these food resources and it would, so you know, I'm not saying this will happen, but let's say some really terrible things happen with nuclear war or fires and we destroy most of our planet. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a restart possibility, <laughs> um, but in the, and that's not where I go in the book. 
No, but no. in I go to our lives, our as individuals, and the life of a lake. A lake, when it runs out of food and runs out of the ability to make to cause more damage, it actually changes roles and it lets plants grow in it that take up carbon dioxide. So the lake starts cooling the planet, and then the longer it lives, the more it cools. <laughs> and yeah. so what I I saw as I matured from a youth and a young adult that was very self-centered and career driven um, was that I could, I could continue that way, but it was going to lead to the death of joy in me. It was killing the joy in my husband. And now I had children on the scene. And what had happened in our lives is that um, by marrying Peter, Mm -hmm. he's a farmer in the Midwest. That meant I could not live in the Arctic. I could not go to Siberia all the time. Like I wanted to. I was going to be stuck (laughs) on a farm in Minnesota and um, far from all the things that I thought that I loved and needed to make me happy. So with that mindset, I was crushing everyone's joy. Mine was gone already and I was feeling depressed, but I realized it doesn't have to be that way. Um, If I give, if I'm willing to give up my idea of what I think I have to hold on to, to make me happy, then um, something else, I believed it, but I was afraid of it. <laughs> um, yeah. And it, something else could come. Maybe there could be joy outside of me. And so by doing that, um, going through that step of faith, I found out that it was true. I can still love the Arctic, but I've been able to be present. In I, it's, What it was was my pride that was in the way. And so if that could let go of that pride, um, then I could be open to what other people and other things have to offer that from the outside that, that can also give joy. Yeah, yeah the pride is it's, uh, surprisingly, uh, it's a sneaky little devil. But uh, yeah, um, thank you for that. Uh, COP27 is coming up. Uh, how would you present your research on little bubbles and why they are important? Yeah, I'm not going to be there, but if I if I was there, um, then I think the important thing to know is several things. Permafrost has been around for a long time. It holds twice as much carbon as there is in our atmosphere. So if we were to flash thaw the permafrost and release all that carbon, it would triple carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Um, But in a lot of places, it's not thawing in an environment that creates only carbon dioxide, but also methane. And methane is a stronger greenhouse gas. So how much methane can come out? What is the trajectory we're on? We we are currently following the business as usual scenario um, where we are still releasing as a society (laughs) enough greenhouse gas that if the climate models are right, it's going to lead to substantial warming. And some, enough warming this century to cause a tremendous amount of permafrost thaw, which then releases more greenhouse gas, and it adds to um, the other greenhouse gases that are there. One very interesting finding, though, is that a, a permafrost is like a freezer, and there's a certain amount of, of food in your freezer. <laughs> and when you open that freezer door and it decay, it rots, and gases come out of it. It doesn't matter if you open the freezer door into a a, a room that you've heated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or a room that you've heated to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The food is still going to rot. It's going to rot faster or slower. But both of those scenarios. So even if as a society we curb our our emissions and we can follow more like an RCP 4.5 scenario, a, a mitigated scenario, that is still the freezer door that's open to a room that's 50 degrees. <laughs> um, it's still warm enough to thaw the contents of the freezer. And there's still a limited amount of carbon in the freezer that will get converted to greenhouse gases. So even, even if we um, are able to curb our emissions, we, we can't quite, only it's the RCP 2.6, <laughs> which is such an extreme level of, um, of mitigation that's unreal, almost un- unrealistic. We can hope for it, but we're not, we're far from it. <laughs> Yeah. that there's still going to be a permafrost carbon feedback. Um, so I think that's point number one. Point number two is that the amount of greenhouse gas that can come out of that freezer mm-hmm. is still pretty small compared to human anthropogenic emissions. So it's more like a headwind. Um, it's act, 
we it's acting against people's efforts. The, the fact that this permafrost thaw is naturally occurring and it will occur faster as humans cause warming. <laughs> um, it's a headwind. It's working against our efforts to, to cool climate change. But whether we heat the planet really fast or heat it a little more slowly, it still causes this permafrost carbon to come out. But the magnitude of what will come out is only up to about 10% of what, what anthropogenic emissions are projected to be. Well, it means that, you know, obviously you should be looking to slow it down if not no other reason by time, figure out how to, you know, to deal with it further. You know, the, you know, people talk yeah. about taking carbon out of the atmosphere and, you know, taking water out of it. I've been reading articles about actually taking water out of the uh, atmosphere, you know. So. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I definitely, I'm always on the side with whether it's human health or, or our planet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm on the side of prevention <laughs> yeah. because we don't, we still don't understand well enough how the whole system works. And so, yeah. you know, we create these problems and then we try to use science to solve them, but a yeah. lot of times we're perpetuating the problems and inventing new ones. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you're probably a big fan of fusion then, huh? Well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, last question, uh, last question, uh, more personal. What do you tell your two sons about their future? And the planets, knowing what you know, you know, and and given your faith, how do you how do what what do you say to them about their you know their future in the planet? You know, they're, they're inheriting it and, and that kind of thing. So, well, a lot of that goes back to our cello lessons. Um, I think that it's their character. Uh, so I'm trying to teach them to work hard. Yeah. To um, really be conscientious about what's right and to do what's right to observe. So they, on their, their recess is going outside on the farm. Um, we have no, every now and then we watch a documentary film or something together as a family on a screen, but we have no screen. So they have good old fashioned boredom to entertain themselves. But what that leads to is observation. They're just naturally outside observing things, um, which I think is a very useful skill. And the more that we can, so if, it, if we relate that to our planet, the more that we can, knowledge is power. The more we understand, the better, wiser decisions we can make to take care of it. So I really want them to um, be good observers, understand how things work, be confident in uh, what's right and wrong, to pursue truth and let that guide them, even if even if it goes against what the rest of society is, is says is popular, <laughs> um, but to know what is right and to know what is true and to to follow that. Right. And a lot of those principles are in the Bible. Um, you know, taking care of our planet is something God wants us to do. <laughs> and then ultimately, what I else I teach them is what we're all going to die. So what happens? Uh, what happens to you when you do? And yeah, right. Uh, well, I mean, uh, have you ever read the uh, the science fiction novel Earth Abides? No. Oh, okay. Well, but it's it's about us failing, and the but the planet shrugs at us. You know, we we're so selfish. We think that if we die as a species, that's end of everything. But it's not the case. Earth, you know, it comes again from the Bible. Earth abides. You know, the Ecclesiastes, the sun also rises. You know, and uh, now the day rises, whether we're here or not. So, uh, right. it's kind of kind of up to us. You know, as a guiding principle. You know, you know, and. Uh, Without getting too, uh, you know, gloomy. But uh, I was wondering, I mean, this, this, the teaching of your children and being in the world with other people and stuff, does it lead, you know, when it comes to sort of having, uh, helping the situation, does it lead to a politics or are you sort of uh, like with the green or liberal or conservative or do you just sort of shy away from all that as a, as something that's not really practically useful at this stage? I don't think that's <laughs> the... um, we don't get too involved in politics. Yeah. And, I, and I guess I, in some ways, would say, to, I mean, we have, as, as a scientist, it's part of my job to term, relate my science to policy. So I do have that responsibility. Um, but it seems like going back to your relativist question, science, it used to be that people would really want to understand what an atom was. They wanted to understand these natural laws. And I, I, there could have been some politics involved, but these days 
science gets used so much in politics and you can take this study or that study to prove your opposing points. Yeah. And, and <laughs> to me, that's not good science. So I like to strip things back to the raw, what is true <laughs> and, and pursue well, that as a good, possible. A good example of what you're talking about is, you know, the COVID origin story, you know, got totally politicized and to this day, we don't really know the origins because people politicized it, you know, and right. good science, good science would have said, let's just go where the evidence takes us. And, but uh, we don't want to, we don't want to follow what Trump said. You know, if Trump says it was China that did it, then obviously right. that, it's just like, now we're not going to find out because the Chinese immediately pulled all their data. Yeah. Uh, and then we had the Nobel but, Prize. And, and even that kind of stuff even happens in climate change. Um, yeah. If I write a paper and a lot of them are talking about this positive feedback to global warming, I get a tremendous media response. People want to make movies about it and do interviews. But I've also written papers about how these lakes can cool the climate. And overall, with all the millions of lakes out there, most of them are these old lakes that are having a good impact. They're causing climate cooling. Um, the phone doesn't ring for those stories. So there is also <laughs> politics in climate change. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's uh, just to end on that. That's, that's, I mean, your book, the title book, Chasing Lakes. Um, could you you make a, a sort of a summary statement about the? You know, I mean, you just you just mentioned you know there there are lots of cooling lakes out there, and we probably shouldn't mention them too much. We might want to go for their fresh water and seal all the goodness out of them before we're done the way things are. But um, that's the but there's a balance there, isn't there? The lakes that are causing problems, and the the millions of lakes that are. Are actually cooling the earth and helping you know helping us uh, to stay uh, in survival mode for a little bit longer um this is something you want to say about the whole you know this whole idea of chasing lakes uh is that a metaphor for inquiry or or, uh, or being a, you know being i a, think so yeah i mean it, it it was um it's what i you got to chase something <laughs> and i chased lakes for a long time um yeah. but i think you can yeah, it's to, pers I'd say for me, it's chasing lakes, but pers and it, but someone else, it can be something else. But I'd say chase truth, yeah. pursue understanding. Don't be afraid of what's true. Don't be afraid of what's true in the context of the rest of society, um, because truth is black and white if from a scientific perspective. And I think in the experiment of people's own individual lives, they can find that to be true as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'd say chase truth. <laughs> yeah. 